Welcome to Small Arm Solutions. Uh, one of my first videos that we did was on the SIG MCX. It was, it was very brief, it was very short. Uh, that was really some of our first attempts at making videos. Uh, that was certainly prior to us figuring out you know, what exactly we wanted to do in this channel to, uh, to sort of stand out. So uh, I want to do a revisit of these MCX. And there's a lot of stuff that uh, we're going to cover that we certainly did in the beginning. And another issue that we wanted to talk about is the uh, carrier change. Uh, the uh, mandatory recall of the carrier and we're going to take a look at both the carriers so you can see exactly why they were recalled and uh, and what the changes are you know the SIG MCX is a very uh, it's a very interesting weapon in its, in its origins uh, first and foremost uh, this is one of the first weapons that was designed as a 300 blackout the rifle uh, started life as a request from a special operations unit to SIG that wanted a 300 blackout caliber rifle and SIG definitely wanted to do something uh, different as well. They wanted to develop a rifle around that cartridge. So when you look at the, the SIG MCX, this was designed as a 300 blackout, not as a 5.56. Five, uh, the 5.56, five, five, I don't want to call it an afterthought, uh, but it was not the primary uh, way this rifle was developed. This was not developed as a 5.56 five, adapted to a 300 blackout. Now there has been some changes made since the initial design that we're going to talk about. Um, one of those changes uh, was the change in the gas port in the uh, in the gas block location, uh, which is probably not a smart decision on, on Sig's part on changing that. But we're going to talk about that. The other thing I want to talk a little bit about too is uh, I've had a lot of time to talk to two of the designers of this weapon system, uh, Robert Hurt and Chris Sorois. Uh, both of those guys had worked together uh, on the development of the MCX, uh, MPX programs, uh, also the 516, the 716, these guys developed. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about those guys too, is you're probably looking at two of the finer, finest minds in the industry right now. Um, they've had asked, it, you know, Chris Sorois uh, has been instrumental in many, many, many designs. Robert Hurt also was on the uh, HK side during uh, the development of the HK416, HKM4. Robert uh, really was interesting because of the fact that he was on that design team. He went over to SIG. And when he got together with Chris Sorois, they basically went to the rifle and said, uh, we want to make something that's, that's better than anything else that's out there. Now, this came after the two of them collaborated on the uh, 716 and 516. Uh, the 516 was something that uh, Robert Hurt wanted to make something that was better than the HK416. There were things that he wanted to do to improve the 516, the, uh, sorry, the 516, number of numbers to try to remember. He wanted to do some things that were different to make it a better rifle. I think the SIG 516 is a very underrated rifle. A lot of people don't really realize that, uh, you know, who designed that rifle. And it was designed as something that was supposed to be a step ahead of the HK416. Uh, when this came around, you you had the same minds who designed, who designed the HK416, HKM4. Then they did the uh, 516 and they did the 716. So you had, you know, a lot of experience into making this. Now, this was not designed as an M a 16 or an M4 type rifle. Uh, this was designed as its own system, uh, being a, a short stroke tap at piston system. But one of the neat things about it was the lower receiver, it was designed so it could be a dropping unit. So if you had an existing uh, M16 or AR15 type lower receiver, you could drop this, this whole unit on there. Some of the interesting design features of this rifle were, uh, first and foremost, um, this actually is a changeable barrel. Uh, we're gonna take a look at that in a little bit. Um, there's a very advanced type uh, mechanism in here, uh, two cl a clamp mechanism that uh, you unscrew, you unscrew, uh, and then you retorque, and you basically have a uh, specific tool for that, which we're going to show you how to use, which is a torque wrench. This particular wrench here is all that you would need to uh, change out the barrel by uh, by loosening up those two screws. The whole barrel assembly comes right out, and you have the opportunity to switch out to either 556 five, or 300 blackout, also different barrel lengths. Um, the actual handguard itself we're going to see here when it comes out it comes in different lengths as well so you can actually shorten it up a little bit they also have a flash suppressor on here that was designed around their new or SIG's new uh, suppressors this is in it's in key mod uh, wouldn't really surprise me to see it sometime in the near future them coming out with an M-lock you know just because of the fact that uh, you're, you're seeing so much M-lock out there removable rail sections uh, you'll see I have two uh, very small uh, rail sections on here. Uh, I have one on the bottom here that I would use for uh, vertical pistol grip 
uh, and the one up here would be for a flashlight but you have different different you know lengths as well depending on what you want to do i was very surprised when i shot this rifle the fact that uh, it did not get overly hot uh, unlike most of the systems that i've shot who have uh, rail systems on them which got extremely hot to the point where you couldn't even hold them without a glove and even with a glove uh, this one stayed relatively cool uh, you do have a one-piece receiver uh, basically you have a uh, aircraft grade aluminum you have 1913 rails uh, continuous one on the top the barrel is hammer forged uh, which certainly is a, is a major benefit they decided to go against uh, chrome plating they went with uh, nitride coating you know a lot of the thoughts behind nitride versus chrome plating is chrome plating adds thickness to uh, the inside of the barrel they can cause some issues with uh, accuracy uh, with, a, with when it when it becomes chi when it becomes chipping also the fact that it's a plating versus a uh, part of the metal so there's a lot of thought that the nitriding process uh, will actually increase the strength of the barrel some believe that it's certainly uh, stronger than than chrome plating i haven't had enough experience with uh, shooting longevity with the nitride barrels yet to really give you a an accurate uh, assessment of that but uh, they felt that the nitriding provided a more accurate barrel, a more durable barrel, stronger barrel. What we're going to do now is we're going to take a look at, uh, from butt to muzzle, uh, some of the features. And then we're going to go into some of the specific features that make this rifle so incredible for as far as it being modular, uh, ambidextrous, uh, and so forth. Um, I also want to do a call out to Brownells to thank them for providing this uh, nice rack here. Uh, this uh, this little thing right here is going to help out a little bit. Uh, you guys being able to see the guns better uh, rather than being laying on the ground also is going to help my wife out from having to look straight down on it with her camera. Uh, but you still have to do that when we take, when we take this thing apart and we show the different parts. So, so we're going to get uh, a little more close in depth into it right now. Starting at the butt, we're going to look. At, the first thing we're going to look at is the stock. Now. This design is really incredible in the fact that you have different stock systems. Uh, we have a few of them to show you, and we'll talk about some different ones. This is a telescopic folding stock. So this one here, you pull the, the handle back on it, and we have several different positions. We also can fold it and it folds to the left. Um, some people prefer it folding to the left because it comes nowhere near the ejection port, but left, right, or indifferent, uh, no big deal. It also does not have a lock to it, so you can just pull it, pull it to the rear, pull it rearward. You have two QD points in the back. Um, you have, I believe, six positions, five or six positions on it as well. But this is not where it stops. This is but one configuration. The figure, configuration this thing normally comes with is this one here. Uh, basically, we just have a side folding stock uh, that's solid wire. I'm gonna show you how easy it is to change out some of this stuff. We have a Torx head screw on there. So all we do is we unscrew. And what we have back here is a 1913 rail. Yeah, a little more screwing on it. So as you see, we have a 1913 rail. So for the original stock, I'm gonna screw that a little bit more. And now we have the original stock that it comes with. Now these stocks are all available uh, for, through SIG. So this is the side folding stock. So all we're doing is we're closing that one. And the other one that I have on hand here is their telescopic. Very similar to like the MP5. So that just slides right in. So we're going to do the exact same thing for as far as unscrewing and uh, mounting it to the 1913 rail. This is not my particular favorite one. This is a little more blocky than I like. Uh, the particular stock that I like on this one is this model right here. Uh, this, as you can see also, is already ready for a pistol configuration. So if you want to go with a pistol configuration, you can knock that right off. And you, have, you can get your pistol barrel so you can convert it from a uh, rifle to a pistol. We're going to put this one back on. And again, this is my particular favorite one. This is the one that I like. You know, it's a it's very narrow. It's it's not overly uh, bulky. Make 
sure we, that I should have been using that rack. That helps a lot more keeping things steady. So that's a, that's a really neat configuration on this. Now also for you guys who like the uh, AR-15 style stocks, there is an adapter on here that allows you to have uh, a standard receiver extension uh, where you can put any of the current stocks on that will fit on the standard uh, mill standard uh, type receiver extension. So again, this one basically set up for anything that you may like. Now we're going to take a look at the lower receiver by itself. As we previously stated, um, this this was designed as a drop-in unit that you'd be able to put on any M16 or Air 15 type lower receiver. So this is compatible. Now some neat uh, things were done on this thing to improve it. First of all, you have a magazine well that's beveled. Uh, that makes it much easier for as far as inserting magazines in low to no level light. Uh, this is the SIG's newest generation pistol grip, which you do have a compartment in the inside, holds batteries. The trigger that comes with this is a standard uh, mill spec trigger. Now, the trigger is going to get a little bit complicated. Uh, the original trigger mechanism uh, with the original carrier prior to the recall, you could put any trigger that you wanted in this thing. However, uh, due to the recall and the redesign of the, of the carrier system itself, now we're a little bit restricted on our triggers. We're going to go over that a little bit uh, later. This was left stock. This was left with the exact same trigger mechanism uh, that came with it. Uh, it's a typical, this was about uh, just under six pounds, just around six pounds, uh, single stage trigger. Now looking at the uh, inside here, you'll see this little button in here. What this is is a tensioning, it's a, it's a little tensioner there. What that does is it uh, exerts pressure on the bottom of the uh, lower receiver to make sure that there is no uh, rattle. And this rattle has no rattle to it whatsoever. This is the, These receivers are very, very uh, well fit. Now looking at the safety, uh, you'll see this is a proprietary SIG design. And I got to say, it's very, very well made. Uh, it enables you to actually get a very easy perch on it to, to move it. So you can use it with both hands. You have the shorter arm on the right-hand side, which you could, of course, switch over if you like if you were left-handed. Uh, I, I really like the, uh, the shorter arm on the, right, on the right side because you can see my finger goes forward without really getting in the way at all. But I can actually take my, hand, my finger and, and engage it. The magazine release, as you can see, is oversized. This is always, always a benefit. So it's easy to get whether you have uh, gloved hands or you have uh, you know, ungloved hands. It's very easy to get to. The trigger guard itself is, is, is into the 7075 T6 aircraft uh, great aluminum lower receiver. And as you can see, it's all part of it. It's oversized, so you'll have no issue with gloves whatsoever. Looking on the left side here, you'll see we have an ambidextrous magazine release. And I like the, what they did with the bolt catch as well. Um, this is much easier to grab a hold of than the smaller uh, little, little knob you have in the bottom of the standard bolt catch on the, on the M4. Uh, this I think is a really, really good enhancement as well. On the rear of the receiver you also have, like, just like you do on the, on the SIG 516 and 716, you have two QD attachment points on one on the right and left hand side. You can see I have a, a Magpul stock that's already uh, in, in this side right here. Looking in the receiver itself, you'll see there's no receiver extension. Again, it doesn't need one. Um, it's all within the bolt carrier group itself. So you can put on these different socks and you can fire it without any issue. It's very similar to uh, like the AR-18 in design for as far as having the, the springs and everything is in the receiver itself. So you don't necessarily have to have this at all. The initial rifles came uh, selective fire. Uh, they were generating around 700, 800 rounds a minute. Uh, they were a little bit of a slower rate of fire. Interesting thing about the <clears throat> the fully automatic capability of this thing was was talking with Chris Royce, the designer. So that was one of their most uh, interesting challenges uh, making this rifle was uh, getting the carrier slowed down enough where you didn't have the bolt carrier bounce issue. Of course, they did fix that, but that was proprietary. You really couldn't go into that. But uh, it's always interesting to know you know where some of the most complicated areas that uh, these things come into for as far as the development process. Machining is. Again, what you would expect out of SIG, it's completely, uh, it's completely beautiful. There's no machining marks. It's very well made. Uh, this receiver is a little bit stronger in configuration, I think, than the standard AR-15 receiver. So the uh, next thing we're going to take a look at is the upper receiver itself. <clears throat> now, as we have this configured right now, uh, we have it for 5.56. Uh, and then we have the spare barrel, which will show how you actually do the changeover uh, with the uh, 300 blackout. So we're th the first thing we're going to take a look at is the uh, charging handle. 
The charging handle is actually ambidextrous, as you can see, uh, both sides. Now, this is actually a proprietary charging handle. You're not going to be able to use anything other than this. As you can see from the profile, uh, this is not your standard charging handle. Um, however, this is very, very easily actuated. I will say um, the way that it sits up higher, I would only use this for the initial charging. Uh, I, I tend to use the bolt catch uh, for everything. So short of uh, locking, using this to lock the bolt back on the, you know, to the rear would be the only time I would actually use this. I would be using the bolt catch. The receiver does have a forward assist on it. It does have a uh, fire cartridge case deflector, which you'll see uh, in the videos where we shoot this, where you can, you'll see the cartridge case hit it and bounce forward for the most part, uh, which is what it's designed for. You have a shorter forward assist on there as well. And on the opposite side, <clears throat> you'll see this piece of metal in here. And we're gonna see if we can get a picture of that in here. What I wanna show you is uh, that metal insert. That metal insert is sort of similar to what Colt did and what Winchester did in the 1968. What that does is it uh, provides a, uh, a block uh, so to prevent the, uh, the cam pin from damaging the inside of the upper receiver, which is indicative of having an um, external piston type mechanism on a receiver of this sort. And it's not really dedicated to uh, that particular cartridge. So uh, SIG has put those in both their MPX and their MCX. Um, it's definitely a enhancement for as far as uh, protecting uh, the inside of the receiver from damage. Is it necessary? No, because generally that'll that'll stop. But is it an enhancement over the original design? Oh, absolutely. The next thing we want to take a look at is the uh, handguard itself. This handguard comes off very easily. As you can see, there's a slot right here, and that will slide right off, exposing the barrel. One of the things we want to take a look at here is the gas valve itself. It's a paddle style. We have uh, in the suppressed and unsuppressed, as you can see, that uh, it's pushed up, but it's pushed down on the suppressed, pushed up on unsuppressed. So basically this uh, is your ability to switch from suppressed and unsuppressed without overgassing the system. This is very uh, important on, these, on many of these rifles. Uh, whenever you're using a sound suppressor, you're going to be overgassing the system. And it's going to cause a lot of excessive uh, uh, wear and tear on the weapon system itself. It's going to increase your bolt velocity. So to be able to have that, I think, is a major, major uh, enhancement. But we're going to what we're going to talk about now is a little bit about the barrels and the barrel swaps. Now, as we can see right here is the actual clamping mechanism itself. Now, um, this is very unique compared to most because most of you just have, uh, you know, like a sort of like a cross bolt screw that holds it in place. Uh, but we have a two, uh, two, uh, two uh, bolt mechanism on here. Now, this tool here does not come with a rifle. It's a Borka Tools 60-inch uh, pound, which is the torque limiter that's... Uh, that is specification out for. I recommend anybody who is looking to get one of these rifles uh, and they want to do the, the caliber conversions that you get these. They're not very expensive. You can get them on Brownells, which is uh, where I got this one. So we're first going to do number one. Then we're going to go do number two. What I have to do now is just uh, pull that off and we're going to unscrew. So we have the 556 and 300 blackout barrel. I want to talk a little bit about the evolution of this system too, because uh, there were some things that were changed. Um, this particularly was not for the better. If you look at the location of the gas port uh, on the 556, if you'll notice 300 blackouts the same, this was not originally designed this way. The original design was to have this one back much further. Part of the design uh, criteria for this was it was to be able to fire both suppressed and unsuppressed uh, subsonic ammunition and to make the rifle uh, cycle with subsonic ammunition you need to have the gas port closer to the uh, chamber itself and that required a modification to the uh, bolt carrier as well uh, the the actual operating rod itself was shorter so we're going to we're going to look at that a little bit on the bolt carrier itself at some point SIG decided they wanted to standardize uh, this for production now with supersonic ammunition it's no issue whatsoever but when you start messing around with the subsonic ammunition on, uh, on this one, you tend not to have uh, the reliability that you did on the original rifles. Now, you'll certainly be able to see why SIG wanted to do that for ease of manufacturing uh, 
and parts com uh, compatibility because you did have to have a separate uh, operating rod uh, that you had to install, which was, still, it was very simple. Uh, but they chose uh, not to do that. I do imagine you'll still see all the military guns that are, that are sold in this variation. I do believe on some of the military versions you're going to see it with the proper location here uh, to give that reliability that it was originally designed for. Um, most people, however, when, if you're going to fire subsonic ammunition, you're going to have it suppressed, so it's not going to be an issue. But for anybody who wants to just mess around with subsonic ammunition without a can, uh, they're not going to have the reliability that they're, uh, that they're going to have with the supersonic. So to reinstall the barrel, very, very simple. We're going to reinstall the 5.56 one back in there. Slides right in like so. And you will see right here where there's a lock pin. It's into place. So what I'm going to do now is we're going to do... Get those nice and snug. Before we use the torque limiter. Now, speaking of calibers, um, although not available at the, at the moment, this will also be available in 7.62 by 39. And SIG really hasn't announced any intents for any other calibers. So again, we're going to go to 60 inch pounds. We're going to do number one first. Number two. So this is easy. Uh, it's not so much easily in the field, uh, but uh, this would not require an armor to have to you know to do this. Now you can get barrels in different lengths as well, SBRs. Uh, if, you, if you so choose, you have it. Uh, you have a you have you, know, you have your tax stamp on it, or for military or law enforcement units, you can get uh, the shorter barrels as well. The handguard, as we saw before, very easily slides back on. But before we do that, I do want to show you again one and seven inch twist, and most importantly for me is to have a nice uh, pinned in, uh, pinned a drilled and pinned gas block, which is uh, that that's absolutely critical to me. That slides right back on. And you have your, your rail. Make sure you guide, guide that on there properly. And as you can see, it's all held right in place by the, uh, the front pivot pin. That's all there is to it. So the next thing we're going to go over is the carrier groups themselves. Okay, on top we have the original. And, on, and below we have the uh, the modified. But let's talk a little bit about why this change was needed. Around December of last year, uh, SIG came out with a mandatory recall of their carrier assembly. Um, there's a lot of misunderstandings of why that was done and what actually caused it. First off, with 5.56 there was never an issue. And with uh, standard 300 blackout there was never an issue. The uh, failure that uh, comes into question was actually inside of the SIG uh, facility itself. They were testing some ammunition. And they had run across one type of ammunition that uh, was prone to slam fire. Slam fire meaning that the inertia from the firing pin itself when the bolt closed was enough to uh, cause the cartridge to, to detonate, which was an unintentional discharge, which can be very dangerous. So basically, uh, by loading the rifle itself, uh, you could have the rifle discharge. Now. First and foremost, I want to say something about this. This is not a rifle problem. Uh, this was the ammunition manufacturer's problem. Now, when you fire, uh, or when you're using a military-grade uh, rifle such as this in, in caliber such as 5.56 and uh, 300 Blackout, you use a heavier military-grade primer. As most of you have noticed, I'm sure, when you fire your AR-15s, if you were to, uh, say, fire a round or chamber a round and then remove that round from the chamber and look at the back, you're going to see a little tiny dimple on the back of the uh, primer itself. Now, what that is, is from the uh, free-floating of the, of the firing pin, just tapping it as it goes forward. Is that safe? Absolutely. There's no issues whatsoever with a military-grade primer. But if you were to put a lighter type primer, say a pistol primer or one that is not uh, to SAMI specifications, that little dent could possibly be enough to uh, set that cartridge off. So SIG reacted to that uh, very, very quickly and 
quite frankly, I think they overreacted to it because it, as a weapons manufacturer, you can't uh, you can't think of every scenario. You can't think of a man, if an ammunition manufacturer is going to make something out of specification or not. Uh, you have your specifications that you have for uh, military grade primers, which is what manufacturers are supposed to be using. So I, I don't believe for a minute that this was a uh, issue with SIG, but SIG uh, is very customer conscious. Uh, they're they're very quick to if there's any kind of a risk whatsoever, they react to it. So they did a mandatory recall, uh, and they wanted to make some modifications to it that would prevent that from happening if anybody was to get this particular kind of ammunition. So it probably took me, I don't know, eight to ten weeks uh, to get the new carrier assembly. Now, I did a video previously on this, uh, probably back in December of the, uh, December 2016, that really detailed uh, the differences between uh, the two uh, the two bolt carrier groups, which I definitely would encourage you to watch. Um, but we're going to take a look at these bolt carriers uh, up close. Uh, some of the first things I want to show you is the disassembly process of these, uh, and I want to show you, uh, you know, the firing pins and how they how they are and what may have caused it. And also getting back to the issue with uh, the original rifles having a shorter gas system for the 300 blackout, I want to show you how that was changed out as well. And then we're going to go into the carrier update itself. This is the upright assembly itself and the recoil springs. You can see how that functions. Um, first, we're going to talk a little bit about how this thing comes apart, uh, you know, for, for maintenance. Again, being an external piston, you don't really get a lot of uh, fouling back there, so it's just something that has to be cleaned every time. But if you're a cleaning Nazi like myself, uh, every time you fire this rifle, you will clean it. The first thing that we're going to do is we're going to remove the recoil springs themselves. So you'll see how we, we can we just lift up, recoil spring comes out. Now we're going to do the same thing on the other side, and this is going to drop right out. Now we're going to remove our recoil springs themselves, and we have the, uh, the actual spring guys themselves. Now the carrier itself actually comes apart the exact same way a standard M16 one would. Push inward on the firing pin retainer, comes right out, firing pin comes right out. Rotate your cam pin, that drops out, bolt comes right out. Now this is actually a standard M16 M4 bolt. Now we're going to talk a little bit about the conversion from the 300 blackout. You notice there's a little bit of a, of a dent down, indent down here, a hole. You would take the firing pin, push inward, and there's a little detent in there. And then this would slide right off. You see the detent in there, how it locks into the carrier. So what you would do is you would replace this with a carrier uh, with an operating rod that was probably about that long. And that would compensate for the shorter distance of the gas system on the uh, 300 blackout. But at some point, SIG made the decision they didn't want to have this spare part. And they didn't want to have this, the, uh, the different parts for the barrel, so they, they changed that out. But again, during the development process of this rifle, this was a major part of it was to uh, to have you have the subsonic reliability uh, without a can. So this was your basic system. Now the bolt itself is uh, compatible with the standard M16 M4 type. But as you can see, there's no gas rings on it. Uh, if this was to say to you have any issues with a failure, you'd be able to take a standard M16 M4 type bolt and replace it. So now we're going to move forward to the recall. Well, as we as we stated, the main reason for the recall had to do with um, having that primer that was not specification. So SIG had to do something about it. So what we're going to do is we're going to show the actual differences. First of all, the the way that the uh, operating rod is, fits into the uh, carrier itself is like a, like a dog leg type right here. Um, this is removable, uh, but this is much stronger the way this is held in place rather than with that uh, the weak pin. And we're also going to see uh, when we take it apart some other difference, but take a look at the top on here. What you're going to see here is actually a firing pin safety, similar to what uh, HK had to do on their 416. Now these were done for two totally different reasons. 
The reason the HK one was is because your rate of fire was so high you were having slam fires. The gun was being over 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 gassed and it was causing it. This one, again, this was all done because of one specific cartridge that the factory tested. What this does is it prevents um, the firing pin from moving until the hammer moves forward and pushes it up out of the way. Now this is what caused the issue with many of the aftermarket triggers, because the way that the uh, the hammer has to move for, the hammer has to move up on it, the hammer has to be able to fit underneath the firing pin block to lift upward so it can it can strike the firing pin and the firing pin can move. Now if your geometry on the top of the hammer is is not what it was designed for, it's not going to disengage the uh, the firing pin safety and it's not going to work. So. This was designed specifically around the mil spec type uh, trigger mechanism. However, there was also a Geisley update where uh, there were some modifications that were done at the factory for people who had Geisley triggers so the Geisley triggers could work. So we're going to take this thing apart and we're going to show you some of the major differences that would make this. I don't want. I just don't want to say better. Uh, I want to say overbuilt to compensate for uh, ammunition manufacturers not making their ammunition properly. So disassembly. Now, the disassembly of this back here was one of the really interesting parts. If you were to see uh, the drawings that came out from SIG, this is supposed to be made out of metal, and it's supposed to be pinned in place so you couldn't take it apart. Um, when I got this, this was not the case. This was still the same as the other one, so I don't know if that's something that they just decided not to change or they're, they're, uh, they're going to at a later date. But uh, this comes apart the exact same way. So now we can take a closer look at the firing pin safety itself. That's it right there. As you can see right there, when the hammer moves forward, it lifts up and disengages it. So until the hammer actually strikes this, this is not going to be able, the firing pin is not going to be able to move forward. So we're gonna take this apart so we can take a look at how it works. The first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna push inward on this pin which holds the firing pin safety in place. That's gonna pull right out. Now we can lift that right out of position. And that my that right there you see is the firing pin safety itself. This is where the hammer has to lift up on it. And if you don't have the proper shape, it's not gonna lift up on it. That's why you have some restriction on what kind of hammers that you can use on it. Next thing we're gonna look at is the firing pin itself. Now this is, a, this is something they changed out that I really do like. Now the firing pin retaining pin is captive which I really, really like. Uh, so you're not gonna lose that critical part. When you pull the uh, firing pin out, we have a spring there. Now that spring there serves two purposes. One, um, it prevents, it, it protects against some of the inertia for pushing it forward. But more importantly, uh, when the bolt starts to move rearward and the hammer starts to move backward, this re-engages with the safety. And what that does is it locks it in place so it cannot move during the, during the cycle of operations. The only way that this will ever be able to move forward to strike that primer is once the hammer hits and releases the uh, frame pin safety. So that's what your spring is there for. So now we can actually remove the operating rod itself. It's much stronger than having it held in by that, uh, that, one, that one notch and that little pin. We can lift out the cam pin. We can pull out the bolt. Now the bolt really hasn't had a lot changed about it. Uh, as you can see, they just removed... Uh, the tail itself that was not necessary anyways. This also could have had something to do with the uh, being able to use the uh, firing pin safety itself because if you were to do this firing pin safety wouldn't work. So they had to be removed so you could use the firing pin safety and what that does do unfortunately is make this not compatible with uh, M16 style bolts um, without heavy modification but uh, this was a necessary uh, evil to be able to uh, work with the firing pin uh, spring. Um, this is basically the same, with the exception of the, 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 the cut that was done, as well as the, uh, the, the safety here, the uh, frame pin retaining pin that's, that's uh, captive. So those are the actual differences between the two. Uh, the recoil spring stays the same. The main difference is in the ability to have the firing pin safety, uh, an improved uh, way of holding the uh, operating rod in place. Uh, now we're, now we're going to show you how to put together the, uh, the new Gen 2 uh, bolt carrier assembly. Just like the standard M16 type, you make sure your extractor is to the right. Now we're going to drop the uh, 
firing pin in from the rear in place now we're going to put in the little if you want to call it the dog leg get in there just, just like so now we need to insert the firing pin safety this is a little uh, when you have size uh, Sasquatch hands this can be a little bit difficult that slides right into place and you want to make sure that you have it properly because uh, there's uh, one end is larger than the other so we're gonna push that in like so you just line up that notch as you see right here and that's all there is to that so now we're going to put together the, the uh, system itself for the recoil springs just like so insert your spring guides Best to do this with the um, bolt upside down. Get on there. Get on there. Get the other spring. And that's all you have to it. Now, the interesting thing about uh, what SIG's doing with this is not only are you returning your uh, your bolt carrier group and they're giving you a new one, they're also giving a fifty dollar certificate uh, to use in their SIG store uh, for your trouble. The process of uh, returning this is you contact SIG, you register your uh, firearm with a warranty, and then they automatically send you out a box that is all prepaid and everything for you to just drop your carrier group into and to send back to the uh, to send back to the factory. Um, this is really costing SIG a lot of money to do this, and I tell you, I give them kudos for um, spending the money that they have, which is a significant amount, to deal with a problem that's not even theirs. Uh, and, I'm, and I solely believe that it is not their, their issue whatsoever. So now we're going to put this rifle back together. I'm going to take the receiver, charging handle, like so. Next thing we're going to take a look at is a couple interesting accessories that uh, SIG now has and accessories that you should have, especially if you're going to be changing out the barrel. As far as magazines are concerned, uh, this rifle comes with uh, the Lancer um, L5 Advanced Warfighter magazine. Absolutely excellent magazine. I think it's one of the best in the industry. Um, so they definitely chose an excellent magazine for it to come with. Uh, Sig just recently came out with a new tool uh, that you can actually get in their store as well. This is a tool that's specifically designed for the MCX. You have, for instance, uh, for, your, uh, for your front sight, uh, you have um, all the different Torx uh, heads that you would need. You have, uh, uh, you know, for just uh, driving out pins, uh, you have all the different hex, uh, hex not, uh, wrenches as well. I'm not really sure what this, uh, this tool costs. Uh, but uh, for someone who have this rifle and you want to be able to have one little combination tool that does everything um, This is definitely a must to have comes on the little pouch as well For as far as any of you guys out there who plan on getting caliber conversion kits for the MCX. This is an absolute must um, I really like this Borka uh, Borka again. You want to get the uh, part number PTL 060 H dash IP 
Um, it's uh, preset to 60 inch pounds. 60 inch pounds is what SIG recommends for the, uh, the screws for the barrel. So, you know, if you're not going to be changing out barrels, this really isn't necessary. Uh, whenever SIG does decide to uh, come out with uh, barrel conversion kits, I do believe the 300 Blackout are now available, but uh, I'm not sure. There's prototypes in 7.62 by 39. Uh, I don't know when they're going to become available, uh, but I'll be certainly interested in testing one of those out once I get it as well. So this is not a really interesting uh, tool. This is not available through SIG. You can get this right through Brownells, or you can go to Borker directly. But again, you want 60 inch pounds. And for as far as those of you guys who may want to mess around with some different stocks, uh, these are only two of the, uh, of the, other, of the, of the other options. Um, there are more. Um, I'm sure you can get this rifle in a pistol configuration if you so choose. Um, the flash suppressor can be removed. Uh, for instance, I, I use a lot of silencer co. My intention is to actually remove this and put on a, a silencer co suppressor. Um, at some point I would like to try one of the SIGs, but this is designed specifically for the SIG uh, suppressor. The optic I have on here is the six is a six hour uh, the Romeo uh, 7. Uh, this is basically a red dot sight um, for a close quarter, which is pretty pretty much what this rifle would be designed for. Um, I've had the opportunity to mess around with a lot of SIGs uh, optics recently. Uh, they've sent me several to take a look at, and I gotta admit they are really, really high quality, um, all of the ones that I've seen. So I've been very happy with them. This also had the uh, the EOTech, which is specifically designed for 300 blackout with a three power magnifier. I've had this on there also uh, when I've been messing around with some of the 300 blackout that has the, the bullet drop compensators for the supersonic and subsonic. But this is very similar to an aim point uh, red dot sight. You have your adjustments on there as well. It has a good throw lever mount. You also will have co-witness with your iron sights. Uh, the iron sights that this comes with, uh, you know, just your typical it's just a, a typical four position and you have your uh, adjustment for uh, windage only on the side there and as you can see when you have your sights up you do have co-witness you do have two uh, apertures on this as well long range and short range so you, you do have a full system um, with the use of the removable uh, key mod uh, rail sections you can literally configure this any which way that you want the ability to change out the barrels any which way you want any configuration uh, you have the ability to put on, uh, you know, whatever kind of sling that you want as well. You do have a rail-mounted uh, QD attachment point as well that comes with the uh, with the rifle. So if you want to mount your sling higher, but plus you have uh, four, I think you have, no, you have two different ones. I'm sorry, you have two two in the front QD sling point attachments, so you can attach to uh, the handguard. You have two in the back of the stock, plus you have the two on the receiver. Um, this is a very very well thought out gun. Um, the issues that came up for the recall. I just wanted to really stress to you guys that this was not due to a defect in the gun. Uh, this was due to a specific cartridge, and SIG wanted to be proactive about it uh, in case any of you guys got a hold of that ammunition that your gun wasn't going to go off on you full auto uh, when you least expected it. It's costing them a lot of money. Now, uh, I sent my carrier group in, in December, late December, and it took me a well over a month, month and a half. That was also immediately once they announced the uh, you know the, the recall uh, to my understanding right now they're getting them out a lot quicker um, I definitely would recommend you guys do it is it necessary again no um, but you know they're offering you uh, an enhancement it's, it's well worth uh, waiting a couple weeks to uh, to get the new one in um, I definitely think that it's a reliability enhancement it's a safety enhancement so I would definitely take advantage of it and what we're going to do now is we're going to take this thing out to the range. We're going to see how she shoots. We're going to shoot both uh, the 5.56 and 300 blackout. And we're also going to uh, show you how to you know, show you again how to change the barrel out because we did that at the range so we could fire both calibers. Out of the range with the SIG MCX. Uh, the first rounds we're going to fire out of this are 300 blackout, which is what it was designed for. Uh, the first two magazines are going to be Black Hills uh, Supersonic 125 grain OTM. And the 20-round magazine is going to be a subsonic. Uh, you're also going to see how this rifle will work with subsonic ammunition as well. Uh,
is the 220 grain or subsonic ammunition. One of, the, one of the most important things about the MCX is its modularity. And uh, we just fired 300 blackout. Uh, now we're going to switch over to 5.56 millimeter. little on the hot side. Now we're going to insert the 5.56 millimeter barrel. Now we're converted over to 5.56. The SIG MCX system is really, really unique. It's really, really well made, really well thought out. It was designed for a specific purpose. Um, as we briefly, as we already mentioned, this was designed at the request of a special operations unit who wanted a 300 blackout. And it still has, to, to my knowledge, the only rifle that's ever been developed for 300 blackout initially, and then adapted to 556. I do imagine over these years, you're gonna be seeing a lot more accessories come out for these, uh, not just to mention just barrels. Uh, the stock, the stock abilities. Um, I do expect to see at some point you see a an M lock, uh, a handguard piece because of the fact that there's so many people who are going to that. Um, 
the MPX uh, is, the, is the 9 millimeter version, which is very similar. It's based on the exact same uh, technology. Um, we, did, we previously did a video on that one. I recommend you go back to look at that video. I really hope that you guys enjoyed this video. Um, I know it's a little bit longer one, uh, especially compared to the first one because there were so many details that I didn't go over because we didn't really know how we were supposed to, what we were gonna do for the channel. Um, if you did like this video, please click like, uh, please subscribe and even better share. And I do want to do a call out uh, to all of our uh, patron subscribers uh, to thank you very, very much for your support.